G'day. Welcome again as we gather the beginning of Psalm 50 verse 5. Gather to me, my faithful ones. That is the call of God, to gather, to gather to him, to find each other beside him, to be around the God of all creation, the God that brings life and gives us life renewed and life afresh. So as we gather this day, we gather in the name of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Loving Father God, we gather here this day in your presence to worship you. We pray now that as we spend time together, we would know your transforming spirit upon our lives, bringing us life and comfort, challenge and correction. That through your spirit, we might know your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing together a song of worship to our God.
Let's pray. Loving Father God, we do indeed praise your holy name. We lift you high. We celebrate who you are and all that you have done. We stand in awe of your goodness, your provision. And in the midst of that place, we recognize our need. Our need for forgiveness, our need for guidance, our need for your love. So we pause and in the quiet of our heart, we ask that your spirit would help us confront our sin, repent and turn to you. Lord, forgive us. Forgive us, we pray. And raise us up in your grace that we might live and love again. For in gratitude for all you have done, filled with your love and knowing the compassion of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray as the love forgiven children of God for the world. We pray this day for all those who, in the face of continued hard news in our world, are feeling down, depressed, saddened. Lord, we pray your comfort and your grace and your love. And Father, for all those who are wrestling with medical issues, we pray your healing. For those that grieve, we pray your comfort. God of grace. lover of us all. In every corner of the earth, near and far where there is heartache, we pray your presence. We pray a new dawn, a new dawn in your love. Come, holy God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's uh, hear a reading from Mark's Gospel, chapter 9. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain, where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He didn't know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. As we come to reflect on these words, let's sing again. 
to our God. today are the ones that are set down for Transfiguration Sunday. This story of Jesus up a mountain with his mates. And then the cloud overshadowed them. And from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Listen to Jesus. Because he is the beloved, the son of God. Where were they? On a mountain. And mountains biblically are important. Culturally, mountains are special places. Mountains often are where the clouds gather. And because of that, they are often in the Near East a wetter place, a place of life. Mountains are where the rivers start, the creeks and the rivulets 
that become the mount, become the rivers on the floodplains of life. Often, there are orchards, vineyards, gardens, and grazing spaces on the mountains because the mountains are places of life. They, the mountain, is a place of provision. Many a fort is built on a mountain, for it is a place of protection. In Genesis 22, it was on the mountain that God provided a sheep of sacrifice for Abraham. Provision. And where did the new life start? After the flood? On a mountain. And mountains are places where we meet God. Exodus 3, Moses meets God for the first time on a mountain. In Exodus 19 and 20, Moses meets God again for an extended session for the handing down of the law. A gift to a recently liberated people that need something to help shape them well as a community. Solomon built the temple on a mountain. The Temple Mount. This was God's dwelling place on earth. Across much of that part of the world back then, mountains were dwelling places of gods. Mountains were as close as you could get to the gods because with a flat earth, heaven was up, hell was down. However your mythology explained that, that was the kind of shape. So mountains were indeed the place where God was met. The expected turn, turning up place. If you wanted to see God, climb a mountain. Now very clearly, we know that Jesus says otherwise. That God is not bound to mountains. In fact, with the conversation with the, the woman of Samaria where they talk and, and the question is put, you know, do we worship God on the mountain or in the temple? And Jesus says in truth and in spirit. Not in a place physically, but in our hearts. But that doesn't take away from the value of a mountain place. Jesus himself often went to the mountaintop. He seeks them out as his getaway time and for significant moments. We think of the Sermon on the Mount, the number of times he goes to pray, the garden on the Mount of Olives, Golgotha, and his ascension. Mountains are important. Clouds, too, are important scripturally. They are important also culturally. Many a person will look to the clouds and say, this is what is coming. Dry, rain, storm. Psalm 18, verse 9. It says this, He parted the heavens and came down. Dark clouds were under his feet. See the, the imagery that the psalmist is using. Clouds being part of the presence of God coming. In Joel chapter 2, it says this, Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound the alarm on my holy hill. Let all who live in the land tremble. For the day of the Lord is coming. It is close at hand. A day of darkness and gloom. A day of clouds and blackness. Hear the mood. Hear the symbolism. God is coming. And clouds are the bearer of God's coming. 
in Exodus 13. It says, The Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so that they could travel by day or by night. And neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. God with the people, guiding the people, leading the people in a cloud. In this case, a pillar of cloud. This is God's way of coming present in this Old Testament reading. In Daniel 7.13, it says this, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. Again, clouds connected to the coming of God. And in Revelation chapter 1, Look, he is coming. With the clouds. Mountains and clouds. Where you find God. And when a voice emanates from the cloud on the mountain. It is the voice of God. It can only be. And what did this voice say? What did God say? This is my son. The beloved, listen to him. The beloved. In Jeremiah 12, Israel is described as the beloved of God's heart. Here, Jesus is described in a similar vein. Israel had a special place in God's heart and in God's plan. They had a special role in God's mission in the world. They were to be the ones who brought the, the message of the beauty and the glory of God to all people. Jesus comes, the beloved, and he is the beauty and the glory of God. Here on earth, walking amongst the people, bringing God, bringing the kingdom close. The beloved, the son of God. In the Old Testament, there are a number of references around sons of whatever. And uh, the referencing in that is simply a statement of being in relationship with. It, the sonship is not a hereditary blood thing, but a connection thing. And so when this is Jesus is described as son of God, it's, it's saying there is a connection here. That's the language people know. But it's deeper than that. For in Daniel chapter 3, there is a moment in the flames where the writer says that one like a son of God was seen in the fire with Daniel by Nebuchadnezzar. One like a son of God. Someone who is in some way in a much deeper, closer relationship to God than what those around are experiencing. In Samuel 7, the word is said that the kings of Israel will be like sons of God. That there will be this relationship with God between king and father God, between king and creator, like a son-father relationship. Sadly, it wasn't lived well by the sons. But it does speak to who Jesus is. Because the kings of Israel were like sons. Jesus is the son. And the ultimate king of Israel. 
He is the one that shows all of those kings how kingship is in the kingdom of God. How they were to have been. He highlights how far short they fell. For he is the son of God, the king of kings. Not just of Israel, but of all. Exodus 4. Israel is described as the firstborn of God. Again, a metaphor to explain relationships. To explain God's seeming preference. Preference with a purpose. Jesus, the Son of the Father, is. It's not a metaphor. It's a reality. It's the depth of the relationship of God. We can be like He was, He is, and He always will be, Son of God. So God declares... In the presence of the heroes of the faith, Moses and Elijah and the disciples, that Jesus, this Jesus, is God's own son, beloved. And God says, listen to him. So listen. Listen to Jesus. Understanding that true listening is hearing and responding. What's the point of having music on if it doesn't touch your soul? If it doesn't create for you a space that is helpful? You're not listening. It's just noise. And we all know what it's like to be listening and not listening. To be listening and not hearing. To be listening and not responding. How many of us have had a conversation with someone in which we have felt unlistened. Unheard. And unloved. Listening. True listening. Is hearing and responding. And that was their challenge. Those disciples and all who came after them, including us. It is our challenge to be attentive, to be hearing and responding, to be listening to Jesus well. For he speaks. He speaks to us. What does he say? What is he saying? Well... There were four who decided that the words of Jesus were so important. They needed to be preserved for the church. And so we have four Gospels. And the church through the age has said again and again, we need to keep all of this together so that the people of God can hear the word of God. As it says in uh, John 1.1, That Jesus is the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. We need to be listening to the Word. How? How do we hear? Well, we make time. We don't snatch time. We make time. We create space where we can listen well. For some people, um, the... The red letter Bibles are a helpful tool. That is, uh, Bibles that have the words of Jesus in red. Now, please, don't uh, get caught up in arguments around this. We need to see what Jesus does as well. But sometimes it is helpful just to hear the words of Jesus in and amongst all of the other words that come into our life. What did Jesus say? And the Red Letter Bible is sometimes a helpful way to do that. It can also become a badge of honour and an idol. Uh, And that's one of the sad truths. That whichever scripture 
uh, version we use, there is a danger it can become an idol. There are people who will you know, basically tell you that if you're using anything other than the old King James, you're on a highway to hell. If you're using anything other than the NIV, then you've been corrupted. Friends, the scriptures are the scriptures. They are a beautiful gift from God. They are not God. And the word that comes from them testifies to the ultimate word of God, which is Jesus Christ himself. So what is Jesus saying for us? What are the words he wants us to hear today? Something different? Something that we haven't heard before? Something that we need to hear again and allow to work a miracle within us? Something specific? Specific word for a specific moment and struggle or point in our lives? Maybe it's you are loved. You are forgiven. You are called to this particular ministry right now. Maybe it's if you've got a grief against your brother, go and sort it in grace and love. Maybe it's turn the other cheek. Maybe it is go and make disciples of all peoples. There are all sorts of things Jesus has to say. Maybe it's something life-giving in these hard days. Perhaps it's a word of encouragement or critique. How often, how often do we really stop to listen to the words of Jesus? I know in my role, most times that I come to the scriptures, to the words of Jesus, I come looking for a message to give to others. I come seeking to be able to fulfill the role that I play within the life of the church. And it takes real discipline. It takes a strong will to say, no, this, this period of listening is not to complete some task, but to hear the word of God, to hear Jesus himself speak into my life. And I suspect for many of us it's the same. When we listen, we are listening for something that is already part of our agenda rather than just listening for what God has to say. So how do we tackle that? Well, perhaps we sit down and we flick through uh, the Gospel of Mark. It's the shortest, the quickest, the easiest. And we read it noting what Jesus is actually saying. Perhaps we note that in Mark's presentation of the Jesus story, the Gospel, the Good News, the first words that Jesus utters are these. The time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. Maybe that's where we need to sit for a while. Until those words come alive for us. The time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. Then Jesus says, follow me. Follow me. Perhaps that's the place we start. Today and every day. Believing, repenting and refocusing on God and following Jesus into whatever he leads us into. Let's pray. Loving Father God, We thank you for the gift of your word, the Lord Jesus Christ, who comes to each one of us in truth and in spirit. We pray 
that we would be attentive to his word. That we would be listening. And in faith responding. So come Holy God. By your spirit. Open our ears. Our hearts. Our minds. Our lives. To the power. Of the words of Jesus. That we might be transformed. And in being transformed. Be part. Of the coming of the good news of Jesus in the lives of those around us. So we offer ourselves to you. Saying take me. Use me. I am yours. In Jesus name. Amen. Let's sing one last time together. you do in word or deed do all in the name of Christ whenever you find yourself in need remember the words of life I am the way to go I am the truth you know I am the life of the earth below the promised son of is speaking are we listening are we hearing are we willing to respond go this day in the grace and the love and the power of God Father Son and Holy Spirit go and be the difference others need Amen choose to be my disciples, if you plan to follow where I lead, take up your cross and deny your very selves, then come and follow me. My life is emptied out for those made low. I bear their burden and their strife. I win them victory upon a tree. Who will give comfort, bring them life? If you choose to be my disciples, if you plan to 
Choose to be. 